the second second area of being able to protect a boiler is really to be able to perform excellent deposit control. So how do we do that? Well, there's two techniques we use. These techniques boil down into two general areas. One is let's remove all of the potential deposit materials before it gets into the boiler. That's what we call external treatment of the makeup water. The other technique, of course, is let's condition all the other potential deposition that might occur in the boiler. So consequently, we'd be adding treatment programs, etc. We call that internal treatment. So we have both external treatment and internal treatment. And frequently, we're using both of those uh, for getting good water quality in the boiler for good protection. How do we actually protect uh, against some of the deposit potentials externally? Well, the most common, very common ways, of course, is the sodium zeolite softening. It removes, of course, only hardness. We use the zeolite softening mainly in boilers up to about 300 PSI. And above that, we, we go a little bit more with better improvement. But uh, sodium zeolite softening, remember, it only removes the hardness. It does an excellent job, but you've got to make sure you're always removing the hardness uh, and we'll be talking about internal treatment in case you have any bleed off of hardness coming in by way of the makeup. There's other larger water operations, lots of more water usage. We will actually be talking about using other processes to improve that uh, water quality by removing some of the hardness, some of the alkalinity, and some of the dissolved solids. We do this with either cold lime softening or with hot lime softening. And this does an excellent job, usually followed by zeolite softening after that to improve the water quality. We actually can follow it with demineralizers, which removes basically, as we know, all minerals in the water. Uh, and consequently gives us essentially pure water. Well, a lot of people have converted over from demineralizers to reverse osmosis. Why do we do that? Is because we can then reduce the amount of acid and caustic necessary to, to regenerate the demineralizers. And reverse osmosis is doing an excellent job. Many people with demineralizers have converted to reverse osmosis, but then they still use the demineralizers to polish the our old product water so that we have absolutely good quality water going into the boiler. Two techniques that we have to be able to prevent, of course, deposits in the boiler. Let's talk about the internal method of being able to control these deposits, and that is one is to use the solubilizing technique. We will hold all of the potential deposition materials in solution in the boiler itself, so we won't allow it to come out. Uh, that's one of the techniques. The other technique is to allow it to come out. We'll talk about that shortly. How do we do this type of thing? Well, we utilize specialty chemicals such as phosphonates and polymers. These are very, very common in boilers operating to 600 PSI. Actually, some boilers operating closer to 900 PSI with some of these new polymers that have been developed. Very excellent products that are being used. Some people go with total amount of polymers in boilers, no longer with any of the phosphates, uh, but it, it, this is a, the newest technology with phosphonates and polymers, and it does an excellent job of keeping the border pretty clean. The other technique, which we've used in the past number of years, and still is used to some extent, but not too often, is the use of the common keelants known as EDTA and NTA, ethylene diamine, tetracetic acid, and triacetic acid. These are, these are very common keelants that have been used uh, in the past. We, we really have not used them as nearly as much anymore because of the corrosion problems that we have with overfeed of EDTA and its control and what have you. Though it's sometimes added in conjunction with the, uh, uh, the polymers and what have you. In all these cases with internal treatment, particularly when we want to keep all the deposits soluble, we really have to have excellent, good feed water quality. This means we have to have less than 2 ppm of hardness. Some people actually say less than 1, and some even talk about less than 1 ppm, depending upon the pressure of the boiler. Uh, if it's higher hardness, this means that you're going to have to add a lot more chemical water treatment, so costs are going to be much higher. Uh, so consequently, you have to do an excellent job of feed water uh, treatment to be able to get the hardness down very low. Then these deposit control agents can function very, very effectively, and they will give you, of course, a very clean boiler when you are actually solubilizing the deposits. This is because everything is in solution. There is no sludge that's being formed. So consequently, you have better heat transfer, you better have better fuel economy. So it, solubilizing in the boiler is a very, very common way going today. 
with the wall type of pressure boilers. The, the other method, of course, which has been still used, and a lot of people still use this technique because it's a tried and proven technique, and that's to add phosphate to the boiler water, and the phosphate reacts with the hardness to form a sludge. Now, this particular sludge it could be calcium and magnesium salts with the phosphate, and once it forms a sludge, we have to keep it suspended, etc., so that we can get it out of the boiler. We want it to stick to the surfaces of the boiler tubes, so we remove it by way of the blowdown. Uh, the use of phosphate with the polymers and the phosphonates is another newest technology, newer technology, that actually will give us much more solubility of the uh, potential scaling materials, deposit materials, and it'll produce less sludge, so consequently the borders will be cleaner, uh, tubes will be cleaner, and uh, uh, less accumulation of deposits. What do we do to be able to condition this sludge so that we actually have a, a more fluid type sludge? Well, they, they have to have to modify that sludge so it does not stick to surfaces. It is free flowing and it will accumulate it in the bottom mud drum so it can be blown down. So we have to actually look at the approaches that we have there. That means low feet water hardness. We need to keep those particles suspended or dispersed. So we do that with, of course, different type of materials. Uh, the natural occurring sludge conditioners, which have been used in past years, and in some, some formulations are still using some of these things as well, but not nearly as many as the, as the new chemically uh, proven uh, polymers and phosphonates. But these are the natural occurring ones that have been used in past years. The tannins and lignins coming, of course, from wood, wood uh, uh, production. Uh, the starches coming in from production as well. These are natural occurring. We've actually used seaweed derivatives in past years. Sugars have been used, and certainly carbo uh, carboxymethyl cellulose has been utilized. Actually, when you go back further, before the development of all of these other chemicals, we used to use things like uh, coffee grounds. We used to use the native uh, not banana, but excuse me, potato peels, and potato peels with their loaded with starch, we'd use that, and believe it or not, we used to use manure at times to be able to condition the sludge that are in boilers. We don't do that anymore because all of these, all of the new chemicals that we're using, of course, are much, much more uh, beneficial and much more effective. When we do form this type of sludge and we use phosphates, it's important that you consider that we're going to carry roughly 20 to 40 ppm of, of excess phosphate in the boiler. That's in case we get any more hardness coming in so that there's enough phosphate there to be able to react with it. We could actually get by with 1 or 2 ppm, but with boiler demand, steam demand, you want to make sure you do have an excess there to be able to protect uh, any additional hardness that may come in periodically due to steam demand. There's a couple of things to consider with the use of phosphates. So commonly, orthophosphate has been used for years, but unfortunately, orthophosphate, when it's in the feed water line and there's some hardness present, it'll react in the feed water line and it causes scale deposits. So many of us are currently utilizing things like polyphosphates because the polyphosphate doesn't react with the hardness to precipitate it. If anything, it tends to stabilize it a bit. Once it gets into the boiler, of course, it breaks down to orthophosphate, and we are actually getting the sludge formation there. Again, like I mentioned, we use phosp uh, phosphonates, organic phosphorus-containing materials, and these very excellent polymers that are being utilized, the copolymers, the turf polymers, the quad polymers are being used extensively in boilers at, ten at uh, dosages of 10 to 30 ppm in the boiler, giving us excellent sludge control in, in those boilers. So we... We get plenty of good new technology to give us excellent protection of the boiler system. But just summarize it quickly of the phosphate treatment programs that are available. We talk normally about the conventional type, which is, of course, 20 to 40 ppm of phosphate. It talks about we do have to have the hydrate alkalinity present in the boiler, in this case, 100 to 350. We don't worry about the ratio of sodium and phosphate in the conventional phosphate treatment program, but we have to get that pH up in that 11 to 12 range to make it work. Very, very effective treatment program, still works well, and is being used by many people. As the temperature goes and pressure goes higher, it goes to what we call a coordinated phosphate, the congruent and the equivalent equilibrium phosphate treatment programs. These are all 
because of higher pressures that are utilized. This probably gives a much better understanding of what level you have to have going from uh, from zero pounds pressure to 900 PSI. You can see where the phosphate level goes from 30 to 60 or 20 to 40, whichever you want, uh, and all the way up. So we're actually dealing with a very low phosphate level when we get to the higher pressure boilers. We also have to look at the conductivity and the dissolved solids, and we look at the hydrate alkalinity. These are all areas that we need to be able to maintain so that we can produce the proper sludge in the boilers, and we get the sludge out of the boilers, and then be able to protect it against deposits. Why do we want to protect against deposits? Well, we all know that any loss in heat transfer means that you're actually overheating that, uh, uh, those tubes. You're wasting a lot of fuel because you need more fuel when you have deposits in your boilers. And if you do have deposits, the boiler tube eventually will be gradually getting softer and eventually will have a rupture that can occur because of the pressure on the inside of the boiler tube. Certainly, we don't want to have any corrosion occur under deposits, and that could be due to caustic concentration. It could be due to, to a lot of different factors for causing corrosion. So deposit control is very, very important. Uh, this is the effect of overheating due to deposits. This is a water tube boiler, fire on the outside. You can see where the pressure in the boiler has actually been pushing those tube, tubes up. Those, those nodules, so to speak, or the, the dimples coming out of the tube, is because it's been softened, the pressure is pushing it out and eventually will give you a failure just like this one shows and that is that overheating has caused this particular tube failure to occur. So deposit control is extremely important.